I was invited to do a lecture this time last year at the London School of Economics, which is one of the high temples of British secularism. And they have discovered at the LSE that the question of doing God in public has become very controversial. There was an airline worker sacked for wearing a, a cross and refusing to, to take it off. She said, I'm a Christian, I wear a cross. And Oh, no, you can't do that. You might offend our Muslim customers. Well, it's actually it's the secular customers you're most likely to offend. And we've had several incidents like that. So the LSE said, well, we're into whatever's going on in culture and trying to understand it. So they invited me to do a lecture on God in public. And I realized that I had to do um, a Paul on the Areopagus kind of thing. And it was a bit scary. And I tried as best I could, it's probably on my website somewhere, to do a lecture on God in public, which was taking the signals from contemporary culture and then critiquing the negative bits of contemporary culture and talking about resurrection. I don't know if anyone has done a lecture on the resurrection before in the London School of Economics, and I got exactly the same reaction that Paul did in Athens. Some of them mocked, and some of them said, we'd like to hear you again about this. It was kind of interesting. Anyway, Paul goes on, we must go on rapidly, to Corinth. And in Corinth, we get the opposite charge, as I said, when Gallio is proconsul of Achaia, verse 12 of chapter 18, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and say this man is persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to the law. And now, breakthrough, big breakthrough. Gallio decides that Christianity is simply another way of doing Judaism. What's the point of that? Judaism is a permitted religion in the Roman Empire. So if Gallio has decided that at least for southern Greece, Achaia, the Christians are not acting extra-legally because this is an internal Jewish matter, this is very good news for the Christians. They don't get that verdict all over. Why do you think Luke has highlighted it here? He wants to say, here's a Roman official. He's an important guy. He's related to some of the big wheels back in Rome, Gallio is. And he has made the decision that Christianity must be permitted within the Roman Empire. If this were to catch on, this would be very, very good news for the Christians and sadly, probably very bad news for the Jews as here. Now, very briefly, because our time is uh, past and gone, Ephesus. Here is the riot, and the riot is caused by business interests related directly to idolatry, translated into religious as well as political charges. Verse, chapter 19, verse 23, Demetrius is a silversmith, and it's, it's the tourist trade, it's the t tourist tat. And you can still, in Ephesus, buy little silver, silver statuettes of Artemis uh, with her 99 breasts, or however many it is. They're really rather bizarre, actually. But uh, people still sell them. It's still good business. But then uh, Paul, of course, by telling people that idols are not gods, was getting the word out that actually, why would you waste your money on this stuff? They're just rubbish. And so Demetrius stirs up the crowd and it becomes a religious charge and a political one. But once again, help comes from a strange quarter. Verses 35 and following, the town clerk tells them off, tells them they're out of line. And he does what Gallio has done in Corinth and he and Gallio do what Gamaliel did in Jerusalem. Remember I said this morning, if you stay true, if you say your prayers and do the stuff, help may arise from strange quarters. doesn't mean you'll always get out of jail free. It means that God is going to be true and will raise up help for his people in whatever ways God sees to be appropriate. I think I'm going to draw a line at chapter 19. I wanted to do 20 as well, but we'll start with 20 um, uh, tomorrow morning. But let me just sum up like this for these passages. Paul's gospel, as I said, is to the Jews and Jews first and also the Greek. And we've seen here what he says in 1 Corinthians, that his gospel is a scandal to the Jews and folly to the Greeks. But it is God's power for salvation to all those who believe. And we've seen throughout this passage, I haven't highlighted it, but it's there all through, the leading and guiding of Jesus himself 
and the Spirit. But the critical thing is then, as the, the early church found all over the place, you have to expect trouble. Because when you put your finger on the key symbols of people's faith and worldview in Judaism, the Torah, the temple, the food laws, circumcision, all of that stuff, this is like burning a flag. And people react with enormous hostility. And within paganism, well, the pagan temples and the sacrificial systems. You know, it's not just they have this vague religious idea this might do you some good in some afterlife somewhere. If you stop doing that stuff of offering the sacrifices, bad things are going to happen to your family, to your city, and so on. And people really do deeply believe that. They believe it still today. But the critique is not that Judaism is bad, so you must give it up. It's that Judaism was the God-given way to prepare the world for the coming of God himself in the pers person of his son. And the critique of paganism is not that the material space, time, and matter universe is a bad place and you've got to escape it, but it's rather that God the creator has made it and it's a place full of power and joy and delight, but paganism perverts that power and joy and delight by worshipping the world instead of God the creator. Creation matters. We do not, I think, here find the Karl Barth nine, you know, the no to natural theology, but nor do we find the easygoing natural theology which says that you can read God's purposes off from the created order so that you just have to see what God is doing in history and then get on board. That's the real point at which you have to say no. Rather, you have to understand history as the sphere of God's strange, patient providence, ultimately calling it to account. And the church is to be the community that witnesses to all of this, to God's grace, to God's infinite love for his creation. And the church is to be, and we'll see this more tomorrow as well, the community which knows how to stand without shame and without fear before the authorities of whatever sort, real or self-appointed, and both matter because you know, in the self-appointed today, I would number the media, for, for example, um, who set themselves up as an authority and have to be confronted um, in inappropriate ways, in appropriate ways. And the church has to learn how to declare that Jesus is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead and to do so in such a way that the gospel of Jesus goes out into those cultures and not just rejecting them, not affirming them as they stand, but transforming them by planting the seeds of hope and particularly planting these communities of faith that will then in each place bear witness to the word of Jesus which is more powerful than anything else. I'm sorry we can't do uh, chapter 20, but I really, I don't want to skimp it, and we'll come back to that tomorrow um, as we take Paul then to Jerusalem and so to Rome.